Uh, good evening, Harami family and Harami listeners. My name is Akeem Jamal, and this is Make It Plain. Uh, tonight, uh, we have, um, uh, we're very honored to have a very special guest with us, uh, Sister um, Moya Mzuria Pembelli. Uh, she's with All African People's Revolutionary Party. And we're going to talk about the crisis in Mali and Guinea-Bissau uh, in terms of uh, the counterinsurgency and destabilization in West and Southern Africa. But before we get to that discussion, we'd like to uh, thank our Rambi family and Rambi listeners for tuning in every Thursday to Make It Plain and the Rambi Radio. Uh, as you know, Rambi receives no uh, gifts, I mean, excuse me, no grants or federal funding. We receive money directly from you, our listeners. <coughs> excuse me. And so along those lines, we have some food for thought <coughs> and some nourishment for the soul. <coughs> and so at the uh, $25 donation, we have the video, <coughs> Lumumba. At the uh, $50 level, we have two books, um, The Destruction of Black Civilization by Chancellor Williams and The Scramble for Africa, uh, The White Man's Conquest of the Dark Continent by Thomas Perkham. At the $75 level, we have four books, uh, Stokely Speaks, a.k.a. Uh, <clears throat> Kwame Ture, and Ready for the Revolution, also by Kwame Ture, a.k.a. Stokely Carmichael. Um, the last two books are Africa Must Unite, by Kwame Nkrumah, and as well as Neo-colonialism, the last stages of imperialism by Kwame Nkrumah. Uh, just to <clears throat> put the night's discussion in some type of context, um, we like to always look at a fixed point in, in time and in history and look how <clears throat> we got to a certain uh, point in time. And so when we look at uh, history from that particular vantage point, uh, we try to gain some insight as well as some lessons uh, from those historical um, events. Uh, two opposing forces meet on the battlefield. One side was a powerful British colonial um, power with superior weapons and well-equipped infantry. On the opposing side was an unstoppable force of the Zulu nation. Only one group would walk away off the battlefield in victory. Behind the colonial government of Britain was a full force of the army and the navy. In addition, the Zulu nation had <clears throat> it garnished moral and political support uh, from. Excuse me. The the, the Zulu nation had garnished um, political support and moral support from other Africans in the country. On the other hand, the British had gained the, the listening ear of the wealthy European industrialists and merchants who believed in imperial expansion. The Zulu nation could not count on anyone but themselves, but they had the understanding and the listening ear of Africans in Asia. The encounter uh, with imperialism on a daily basis so in 1879, the Zulu nation on the Saka Zulu, with just spears and arrows, wiped out 1,500 British troops on the Battle of Zazalawan, and it was a shock even to the Europeans because the, it was, became the vi greatest victory ever won by Africans against the Europeans on the continent. It had been over 90 years before the African army would have a decisive battle against Europeans on African soil. In the Western Africa, under the leadership of Mark Cabral, the revolutionary PAIGC, he was one of the greatest revolutionary theoreticians and practitioners of the 20th century. It was a fought, it was a long, hard-fought battle against impoverished Portugal, who was backed by U.S. imperialism, and finally, in 1973, Guinea-Bissau, Angola, and Mozambique was granted their independence. And Mark Cabral had this to say. I always bear in mind that people, we're not fighting for ideas. We're fighting for things in anyone's head. 
they are fighting to win material benefits to live better in peace and to see their lives go further, to guarantee a future for their children. In other words, Cabral was saying that we're not fighting for any idea, but we're fighting for food for our stomach and future for our children. Cabral recognized that begging for justice and equality was not the same as having power. Cabral heard the call for United Africa that had been put out by Kwame Nkrumah some 20 years earlier. Welcome to Arambi Radio, sister. Moya, how are you doing? Uh, I'm I'm doing doing okay. Um, uh, you know, tired. Uh, not enough of us organizing and, and carrying out the work for our people. But it's a blessing to you know to be here today. It's a blessing to be able to continue the work and the struggle of Pan Africanism and to uh, also be a part of the Pan African family of Harambe and be able to share um, you know some of what's going on um, in and around Africa and the diaspora and to encourage uh, African people and those who are struggling for justice and equality um, and the the food and water and housing and shelter that Amil Kakar Cabral talked about and the people of PAIGC talked about and fought for uh, that we take up the same banner that we realize until, you know, this, wicked system of, of uh, profit over people, capitalism, uh, which was birthed in slavery, in the African slave trade, and the destruction of the indigenous peoples and nations of the Western Hemisphere. Until we destroy that kind of anti-human system, we're going to be having the same kind of discussion and struggle, but I'm just glad to be a part of the discussion and a part of the struggle. So, you know, Madase Asante Sana for the invitation. We really appreciate um, Sister Moya coming on. Uh, we know that, you know, whatever, you know, the call is put out, you are there, and, and we really appreciate, you know, uh, all your energy and all your effort. Um, I've known the sister for, for a while, and, and I, I know the kind of dedication and commitment uh, that she put forth in her work in the community. And, and whenever there's something to be done, I mean, this sister never has, hesitates to do that. And we very appreciate um, for having her. One of the things that I wanted to ask you, uh, do you think Cabral's words are just as viable now as they were 20, 30 years ago? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think they're even more important today, not just, uh, you know, Cabral, but uh, Thomas Sankara, Kwame Nkrumah, uh, Ahmed Sekoutoure, and, and many others. It's just as important today, even more so today than ever before, because uh, it's as if the imperialists are trying to turn the clock back, uh, you know, uh, 50 years uh, and uh, take back those territories through neocolonialism or through outright uh, imperialist chauvinism, uh, as, you, as you can see when, you know, AFRICOM can have bases in Africa uh, and begin to build their own forces within Africa, and then the French can come and land right in Ivory Coast or uh, Mali uh, to protect its so-called former territories, uh, you know, uh, that they are actually trying to turn back the clock. So this struggle uh, for, uh, you know, man and woman's ability to control their own destiny, feed and clothe their own people, and decide how and where uh, and and why they would develop their resources. Um, I mean, these these same questions and these same struggles that Amil Car Cabral and many others, you know, talked about, organized for, and fought for, are even more important today because uh, Africa's uh, liberty uh, and Africa's sovereignty is once again at stake. Um, and uh, I think, you know, as uh, Lenin, uh, the great V.I. Lenin said that, you know, imperialism is the last stage, you know, of capitalism. And this is really, we can see with the economic collapse uh, of capitalism uh, throughout the, the global G8, you know, world economy, that they're more desperate than they were during the African slave trade. And so they're going to take desperate measures. If they can 
you know, this is the 10-year anniversary of the war in Iraq, and if they can make up reasons to go into Iraq and destroy which was, you know, what was a developed country uh, with a developed economy, one of the highest literacy rates for its people and especially women in that part of the region, uh, you know, in a thriving um, society that was secular, you know, which was also unique. I mean, if they can just outright do that, uh, destroy it and take the resources for themselves um, because they want control of that geopolitical region and those resources, then that lets you know that uh, imperialists are desperate and they will do and make up any reason to do what they need to do. And so, you know, we need to be organized and ready. You know, you mentioned the sovereignty and liberty of, of Africa is at stake. And, and we all know that, that, that Africa is the foundation for a lot of the wealth and the resources around the world. I mean, we see, you know, um, the diamonds and the gold and, and the uranium and all that stuff coming out of Africa. And and one of the things that, that we understand over here, that has always been the struggle to control black people's labor, to control our ability to um, do for self. And so we see on the other side of that coin, it's always been about Africa being self-reliant. But every time uh, Thomas Sankora or Lumumba or Kroma tries to come forward and unite Africa, when it, you see that there are forces, these imperialist forces that move against them, let's look back in the last 30 years, we can see that Imperialism has gone through various stages, as you mentioned. Um, and Krumah and Lenin talk about the last stage. And in this last stage, we see crisis after crisis, but we also see the inter-imperialist crisis. And, uh, and, for example, what's going on in Cyprus right now? It's a crisis going on. The European Union is saying, you pay for it. And America is saying, you pay for it. And then... Uh, Russia saying, well, why don't you take it out of the, the bank account to the people uh, in Europe? We see this, this rivalry being played out um, for the last 30 years. Um, the United States of America has uh, instituted this neo-colonial um, policy in, in what they co host to destabilize Western and Southern Africa. In particular, the illegal, illegal government that initiated a coup and and um, in Guinea-Bissau, we try to derail um, democratic elections and target um, the African People's Party, Independence Party of Guinea, and Cape uh, Verde. The women and youth were targeted. But despite all of this has been going around, you see that the people of Guinea-Bissau are resilient. You know, they are re uh, relentlessly struggling against this corrupt regime that has taken, taken power, this military junta that yeah. remains in power, um, which has unleashed a wave of repression and terror against the people. My question to you is, do you think that it is now more vicious, more repressive than it was even in 1973 and 1974 prior to the revolution? Uh, you mean are the people more repressed or... Uh, I'm talking about imperialism. You think imperialism is more entrenched in in Africa than it was before the revolution in Guinea-Bissau and Angola and Mozambique? I, I would say uh, I would say not because uh, prior to independence, uh, you know, we had African. We had a, a really a, a, a sector of the African population that was uh, more or less still uh, struggling to make its way from, say, a, a, an ethnic or tribal type of formation uh, to a national democracy. And, uh, you know, with the growth of the movement uh, the various people's movements, uh, it really helped to galvanize many areas uh, and many regions to help bring uh, the people's democracy, which was a natural part of its culture, to the fore. 
Are you still there? Yes, I'm still there. Oh, um, and, uh, you know, prior to these independence movements realizing their own power and their own capability and also the advancement of the military, uh, you know, element of our political movement, um, uh, imperialism was so uh, entrenched and colonialism was so entrenched in Africa that it, it literally dictated the day-to-day -day reality of African people. Uh, today, that's not the situation. Mm -hmm. They uh, certainly have destabilized many parts of Africa uh, by creating these proxy wars uh, uh, and creating the confusion within, say, the Congo, Sudan, Somalia, um, and even, uh, you know, in, in the regions of Sierra Leone and Liberia, which, you know, it was a part of um, uh, creating uh, much of that chaos because once you create chaos, then you need the Western forces to come in and, and rescue your situation. So, you know, we don't manufacture guns in Africa. Uh, we're not uh, manufacturing bullets in, in, these, in this weaponry. This stuff is getting in through uh, emissary, its emissaries in, uh, from Israel um, and uh, Western Europe, and so uh, as well as America. So, you know, they are creating the chaos. But in other areas of, of Africa, where we are still maintaining our political power, uh, you know, areas uh, such as Zimbabwe areas such as Namibia, areas such as Mozambique and Angola, uh, you know, these, these territories, and, you know, and some of these other areas that may be neo-colonialist, but they may not be as entrenched uh, in, in dictating their own reality. So I don't think they are as entrenched as they used to be, which is a victory for us, uh -huh. because the difference uh, from yesterday to today and yesterday, I mean pre-independence versus mm -hmm. today, is uh, Comrade Amilcar Cabral, uh, uh, our comrade, you know, uh, and our first president, Kwame Nkrumah, uh, Seko Ture, uh, Modipo Keita, and many others work towards unity. And this unity cannot be divided. The unity that, uh, uh, that the PAIGC developed with Mozambique, Angola, uh, uh, Principe at Cape Verde, uh, the the unity that was developed amongst those forces to uh, break the Portuguese, uh, break their capability and their uh, their ability to continue to um, maintain wars on all of these various fronts in Africa, it broke Portugal. Uh, at and at the same time, the bond the collaborative political and military bond between these forces helped to strengthen Africa because it, it brought liberation to those territories by maintaining uh, that political and military war for, you know, like in, in uh, Guinea-Bissau's case, for uh, over 11 years. And so at the same time, and the beauty of this is at the same time, and it's similar to what's happening today, the more Europe entrenches itself in Africa, the more it has to exploit its own people. Portugal was going broke trying to maintain these wars. And so its own people in Portugal got tired of starving for these wars in Africa, and they, uh, you know, created the, uh, the conditions. The conditions were created for the people's movement to advance even in Europe. And at least they forget that, the you know, the first, uh, socialist revolution in 1917 happened in Eurasia. Do they really think that places like Greece, places you know, places like Germany, uh, places like Western Europe could not mobilize? Ma I mean, they they organized hundreds of you know half a million people marching against the war, marching against economic austerity. I mean, uh, you know, European workers can't organize, and if they galvanize themselves. Uh, you know, to a certain extent, they can break the momentum of these governments that are trying to take resources out of Europe, bleeding the, the European worker for Africa. Uh, that has happened before, and that can happen again. Simultaneously, our unity amongst our forces will help strengthen 
uh, our capability. And what we need is coordinated action, the same thing that Angola, Mozambique, and Cape Verde uh, did when they collaborated to keep these Europeans fighting on all these fronts. We can do the same thing. And we even have more unity today. There's more unity amongst uh, you know, for most uh, for uh, Mozambique, Angola, Namibia, there's more unity for uh, uh, Zimbabwe in support. You know, it's Africans and Africans in the diaspora who supported Zimbabwe, even when the British were, you know, uh, attempting to uh, create embargoes, and the U.S. was, you know, trying to create embargoes and sanctions against Zimbabwe. It was Africans in the diaspora and Africans on the continent that stood alongside of Zimbabwe. And so, you know, the reality is today we are, even though the picture may look bleak, in reality we're in better control today of our reality than we were prior to colonialism. It's it's so important that our people hear that because they're bombarded with all these images and all of these myths and all these lies that are coming down to, uh, from 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 Africa, and and I remember seeing on the cover of Newsweek, um, Hell on Earth, when they were talking about the, the war in in Rwanda. But, you know, you mentioned you know the people uh, of the other end getting tired of war, and most people don't realize um, that it was the French people, the workers and the students, that closed down the French government for eleven days to protest the war in Vietnam. Right. I mean, no, nobody even speaks to that. That was the same time in 1968 that things were going on with with Tommy Carlos uh, down in Mexico. Uh, we see the tenth of to, the Tet Offensive um, launched in 1968. Um, you see the the civil rights and the Black Power movement going to another another phase. So, in 1968, you see a worldwide revolution that's taking place. But I want to go back and look at what has happened in the interim in, in, in Guinea-Bissau. We know that um, Cabral's brother took over um, for, I believe, what it was, eight years. But what has happened since that was he able to get uh, loans from the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank? What happened in the interim that led to these um, recurring uh, coups, then now we are in this situation today. And do you think that uh, Mozambique and, and Angola are willing to come to the aid of their sister um, nation in in Africa? Well, you know, it, it's interesting, you know, that uh, in reality, uh, if we look at our history, you know, if we look at history and, and African people, uh, outside of Africa tend to look at our history separately. But if we look our, at our history collectively, and, and particularly with what's going on in Africa as well as outside, uh, what we'll find is every place where there, were, uh, where there was a revolutionary pan-African type of party uh, and, and institution that came to bring independence to power in Africa and began to collaborate and coordinate unity, like there was Ghana, Guinea, and Mali, uh, you know, in the uh, in the 60s, uh, the unity between the CPLC, you know, working uh, CPLP, excuse me, the 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 uh, Portuguese speaking countries within Africa, Mozambique, Angola, uh, Guinea Bissau, Cape Verde. Uh, the, the unity in the southern regions, uh, even the unity between Cuba and its assistance to the struggle in Angola and southern Africa. What you'll find is uh, the strategy of imperialists then began uh, to look at a different method of operation. And that uh, method of operation, as Nkrumah correctly pointed out and coined, was neocolonialism. That became their uh, next plan of action. Uh, and so uh, in reality, everywhere you had these Pan-African forces, you also had these neo-colonial elements that began to be used. Uh, you know, uh, they would give loans. 
Uh, they would give military equipment uh, and, and direction uh, in terms of creating the conditions for uh, disorganization and chaos. Um, and, and so you had these multiple coups that happened after you have the PAIGC coming into power. Then you have a, a pretty much, uh, you know, off and on situation where uh, after uh, Luis Cabral, uh, you know, is in, is, is, is becomes president, uh, then you have, you know, uh, one coup after the other uh, uh, of these various formations or people coming to power, you have attempts for multi-party elections, uh, but there's constant, there's an attempt to create constant instability. Uh, and that's similar to what happened, you know, uh, and what's been happening in Mali as well. Uh, now, uh, and, and again, that's the situation that they've tried to create in uh, Zimbabwe. And, you know, again, if you had a revolutionary party, they tried to, you know, Clinton was pushing these multi-party elections. And, again, multi-party means let us bring in some reactionary neocolonialist elements into your areas so that we can manipulate your politics uh, and begin to, uh, you know, put in the imperialist plan. So these are the kind of things that they did at the same time that uh, they realized that the disruption, COINTELPRO's disruption of the Black Panther Party and various other organizations that were going on here, uh, that, you know, we could have not just have plants within these organizations, but we'll have, you know, outright assaults and attacks to destroy, you know, these various movements that are going on both here in Central and South America, you know, the New Jewel Movement in Grenada, uh, uh, you know, attacking Nicaragua, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, you know, their, their, uh, their uh, you know, strategy becomes disruption. Um, political, military, creating neocolonialist elements uh, and agents. Uh, and that is, you know, pretty much been the history in terms of the imperialists. But what they underestimate is the power of mass political organization. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, you know, the fact that the people of Guinea-Bissau fought in the countryside, organized, uh, created institutions and structures within its organization to not only uh, train its men and women to fight physically, but they had ideological and political training. They brought literacy uh, into the countryside and trained young people to read and write. That was one of Cabral's most important, you know, initiatives is that he said our people must be literate so they can understand the ideas and, and transform our culture. Uh, and, of course, you know, he was one of the most important proponents in the movement of culture, realizing that our cultural power is translated into our political and economic power. And, you know, as was said, power that is not organized is no power at all. And so... You know, that, that was a critical element of it. So to underestimate the potential for PEIGC through this whole struggle, the PEIGC has continued to be a mass-based, not a vanguard-based, a mass-based political party that can go into the countryside and, and go into the cities and win there's elections uh, through discussions, through struggle, through organization, uh, win the majority elections, and that's what has happened. Every time uh, they get into a majority election, then the enemy has to come in and create destabilization, and they're using the agents of uh, ECOWAS uh, because, of course, you know, Nigeria just got uh, several uh, uh, billion dollars of loans from the U.S. at the end of last year. Uh, you have Cote d'Ivoire who's gotten, you know, loans and assistance uh, in quelling the violence, they use the ICC, you know, to create, you know, so-called justice, you know, a justice court in Begrade. But the ICC seems to be only going after certain elements within, uh, you know, within Africa. Uh, you had NATO, which we just, you know, we just had the March 19th was also when NATO bombed Libya. 
Libya, again, was one of the calming forces. It was a force of peace. It was the force that brought elements within Somalia to come and discuss and negotiate peace. It was the, the force that was bringing together the leadership and actually had helped orchestrate peace agreements in Mali uh, during the 90s uh, and, and help them to bring unity and also gave them loans, $6 million, in, you know, uh, in, in francs, in loans to help, you know, create jobs and industry within Mali. They were given, bringing loans and giving loans to, um, to uh, uh, Guinea-Bissau, you know, and helping it to build this infrastructure. And so when you have these elements within Africa that is coming together and helping to develop Africa, the European doesn't want that. Imperialism cannot survive if Africa strengthens itself economically and politically. And so you have to step up your assault. And so the onslaught and the assault was the bombing of, of Libya, you know, to destroy uh, an entity that had not only been an economic and political comrade to many of the microstates in Africa, but it also, uh, you know, uh, helped to, to bring political stability. And it was bringing forth the vision, you know, of Nkrumah and Ture for a United States of Africa, a Central African bank. I mean, these things would cripple Europe and America. And so it had to be stopped. Now, what was also going on in Guinea-Bissau is that uh, because of what was happening with Libya, uh, uh, Angola had made agreements with, uh, with the government since PAIGC has this longstanding relationship they made agreements with the victory of the elections uh, April 12, 2012, uh, you know, where uh, we won, uh, you know, uh, a majority of the votes, uh, and they, we had to have a little over a majority, so there was supposed to be a final runoff election April 29th. Uh, so the military command in Guinea-Bissau decides that, oh, uh, you know, we hear that there are deals being made with Angola, Angola is, is going to be, you know, destabilizing the military. Uh, you know, there are rumors that Angola is going to do this and that. So they decide to orchestrate a coup. The reality is, is that once PAIGC won majority votes, they had public agreements with Angola for loans to help build its fishery, to help modernize its military, to help bring, uh, you know, uh, funds and resources for uh, uh, stabilizing its, you know, its uh, economic institutions, uh, same way that, you know, uh, that Libya had been assisting. But, of course, imperialism doesn't want that. So they have these forces in and around using Senegal, using Nigeria, using Cote d'Ivoire, using Burkina Faso, uh, and they use these forces to come in and probably make deals that, you know, create some instability, create some chaos, we'll support you, and we don't want Angola to come in because Angola is going to come in and help bolster and support a PAIGC government. And they don't want that because a PAIGC government, just like a Mugabe government, is going to say, the resources in the ground is going to support African people. It's not going to allow corporations to dictate the day-to-day -day realities of people in Guinea-Bissau. It's going to not only support people of Guinea-Bissau, it's going to also support and strengthen all of Africa because it's a pan-African party, and the imperialists don't want that. So. Uh, you know, really ECOWAS, these forces within ECOWAS, not all of ECOWAS, but these forces within ECO, ECOWAS uh, out of Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire, Nigeria, uh, you know, and Senegal have really been the leading forces to say one thing. They condemn the coup, but at the same time, they're, you know, uh, working to try to drop, you know, sanctions against uh, Guinea-Bissau so that this so-called transitional government, who are the coup makers? Not the ones who got the majority of, of seats, PAGC, 
but they created this transitional government of the coup makers to be able to be the interim, uh, uh, you know, uh, transitional government and controlling the reality so that funds can flow freely to them. But through, again, objections of Relimo, MPLA, et cetera, uh, and PIGC and other forces, in- including, you know, uh, the AU, they had to, to push back and say no. Everyone has condemned this coup, the UN, the African Union, formerly ECOWAS, CPLP, SADP, ABA, et cetera. We have to keep the sanctions until we have elections. So that's the game that has been played. And so in the interim, since April 12th, they have been kidnapping folks, kidnapping leadership of PAIGC, beating them up. Uh, you know, uh, pushing the the folks who had won the election, pushing them, trying to push them out of uh, Guinea-Bissau so they won't be here and participate during the elections, trying to to bring fear to the people. Well, what have the people done? The youth have organized an anti-coup front and had demonstrations and programs. The women have organized fronts. Uh, uh, The religious sector have organized fronts. The people have unified and created, you know, a mass people's party front, because the political foundation of Guinea-Bissau is based on its political, economic, and cultural revolution, and that cannot be erased. Even the last time I was in Guinea-Bissau, the fact that I can meet veterans of the war, the fact that I can still talk to brothers and sisters who are veterans of the independence struggle, do you know, do you, I mean, They're still alive. People still know who these people are. It's a small country. And these people are revered because they they beat the Portuguese and defended the integrity of Africa. They defended the integrity of Guinea-Bissau. This culture resonates not only in the cities but throughout the countryside. And that cannot be wiped away or washed away no matter how many people you kidnap or beat up. But that's what they're doing. These little puppets are trying to terrorize the people of Guinea-Bissau. And so our responsibility is to inform the masses of our people that we have living heroes of the struggle in our midst, that they are still trying to defend the integrity uh, of Africa, which will uh, also uh, benefit us as well because we're colonized. We don't own anything. We don't even own a 7-Eleven, you know, we are a colonized people, and all we have is our political knowledge and our political power. But our political knowledge and political power must be organized. And that's why we have to realize the power and strength of political organization and political unity. Political unity in collaboration can defeat the enemy. It's happened before, and it will happen again. Uh, you know, and so we are in a situation to realize that no matter what, you know, the imperialist does, they cannot maintain a war on all fronts. And at the same time, all we have been doing is fighting a war since colonialism, even since slavery. We have been in a war since the African slave trade. And so we know war. We know the culture of war. Europeans are, are freaking out. Uh, over the economic situation, we've lived this depression. I just watched a documentary called American Winter, and I posted on Facebook. It's like we've been. Uh, Gil Scott sang about winter in America. We've been having winter in America since we landed in America, and so our culture is one of resistance, of resilience, of struggle. You know, of victory. We just have to realize that and build upon that. You know, Sister Moya, it's it's so important that our people hear that because, as I mentioned earlier, we are inundated with all these uh, images of Africa of of you know starving babies and and uh, living in mud huts, and and this is the reality they want to show African people. But you also mentioned about culture, and I remember the words of. Uh, Kwame uh, Ture, he says culture must be used as a weapon of, of revolution, of informing um, the people, of raising their consciousness. And we can see this in action. It's not a theory. 
It's not an idea. We can see it on the ground uh, from your description of Guinea-Bissau. And, and if we turn briefly to, to, to Mali for, um, for just a second, we can see that the, the French intervention uh, sided with, 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 the, with the terrorists, with the, with the, the coup. But they also further try to do to create instability in the region. And see, the, the French took a basic position, and and there were no, uh, you know, there was no um, hiding it. The fact they came out and said, you know, that we feel we just let let the Africans kill themselves, and we'll go in and take the resources that are left from the country. You mentioned uh, the economic uh, community of West Africa states. But we see that you know it's weak. And, and, and his ability to do anything, even in the sanctions, uh, which do nothing uh, but in, end up hurting the, the, uh, the masses of African people. I'm looking at, okay, what is the, the big picture here? What is the, the, the impact of, of this, these recurring coups in, in, in Guinea-Bissau and, and the impact of the coup in, in, in Mali, you know, um, you know, I, I see it as, as, as twofold, and you can tell me, uh, you know, how you see it as well. Is that this military destabilization towards democratic process? First of all, throughout Africa, it places the African um, masses um, in the crosshairs of this, um, you know, brutal uh, oppression, and exploitation. Uh, one of the things that, that, that Kwame Ture says is when. When imperialists can't undermine um, the country, uh, when they can't undermine the party, then they turn to to um, these other means, like a coup d'état. And he, he also said something else when that that was very important. He says that um, the intention, and he's speaking about the imperialists, is to hold back progress for developing countries where circumstances favor the establishment of ventures more token industrial character. The aim is to see that they are um, made haltily. In other words, what Kwame is describing here is that Western uh, imperialism want to give the imp uh, impression or the appearance of aiding um, the developing countries. But in reality, they don't want them to succeed. They don't want them to be self-reliant. But you see that these token gestures um, by the government, when it is only a means in which to um, uh, uh, placate uh, these African countries. Um, but we see that behind the scenes, um, imperialism um, has been raising price for food uh, while trying to plunge um, these African countries further into debt. And, and so we might say as a catch-22, but this is the way they've always operated on the continent of Africa. They've always been in a position to try to undermine um, the economic and political sovereignty of these nations. Can you speak a little bit in terms of what is the impact, um, not only um, in Guinea-Bissau, but also that whole region of uh, um, Western and Southern Africa? The impact of the coups? Yeah, yeah. I mean, how has it has a ripple effect, you know, in in the neighboring countries? Um, you know, we we tend to look at things in isolation, but it's a whole region. It's Mozambique, it's Zimbabwe, it's uh, Zania, it's all of those countries are interconnected, but yet we tend to focus on the, on the individual aspect as opposed to what this ripple effect or the consequences of this. Uh, instability or destabilization in, in Western Africa? Uh, well, I, I think, you know, no matter what part of Africa uh, or, or what part of any country or, or continent that has happened, whether it's Central or South America as well, uh, I think what, what we find is, uh, is if your life is destabilized, if there's constant chaos, uh, and confusion, uh, then that's how you you live to survive the chaos and confusion. People often uh, have to move in different regions. They have to move to different areas. 
They may have to move to a neighboring territory, realizing that these territories really are just the other side of a a European-made dividing line when these people were really all and are still all a part of similar families. You have Awe in Ghana that are half on the Togo side, half on the Ghana side. You know, you have people that are Ka or Shanti uh, that may be some part of, when I was in, in Ghana uh, in September and October, you know, they you had the instability in, in Cote d'Ivoire, and so you have folks who were, uh, you know, going back and forth the border, but these borders are created by the European. These are the same people. They're going over to visit family. They got, you know, business. They got, you know, whatever that they do, and they they cross that line all the time because these aren't real borders. These are artificial European-made borders. But the, these people in their groups, in their families or ethnic groups or whatever you want to call them, uh, they exist on both sides of these dividing lines. And so, you know, part of it is, is that now people have to go over to one side or the other. They, you know, and these, these territories that are already, already struggling – now have people who are coming over, you know, on the so-called peaceful side, looking for a place to stay, creating, you know, you know, uh, uh, shacks or, or, or looking for housing, looking for work, you know. And then you've got a struggle. Sometimes you have a struggle, depending on the, the government or the party, sometimes you have a struggle of people saying, oh, they're foreigners, they're taking our jobs, you know, they're, they're, they're uh you know, they're moving into these uh, lands that, that belong to this group or that group or whatever. And so, uh, you know, you, you, you have sometimes uh, the, the instability of people have, having to constantly move. And then, uh, you know, the other areas having to be host to people who, are, you know, are moving and leaving their area. Then you have, you know, instability for the children. Children who may be in school are now taken out of school or may be getting some kind of training. Or you may have business that you're doing in the marketplace. Now you got to pick up and go. And women are the, the greatest victims of these, uh, of these coups and these wars because women really are the ones who are maintaining uh, the marketplace. They're the ones that are doing these local businesses. They're ones that are, you know, maintaining the family to a certain extent. And so they're having to not only have to pick up and go, but in some of these very violent wars, they are being raped, beaten, killed, used as proxies, you know, to humiliate boys and men and force them to join the other side. Uh, You know, so you you also have this horrible culture of rape camps uh, in some of the more violent, you know, wars uh, that are going on. And... You know, again, all of this being done with the, you know, with the the support and sponsorship of the imperialists, because destabilization allows, you know, this this, uh, you know, need for the external force or the foreign entity to come in. The UN, like the UN, came and saved Lumumba in the Congo. You know, in that same way. The UN and, and these other forces are coming in and destabilizing, further destabilizing, uh, creating, you know, deciding which more reactionary elements they're going to support and sponsor that will keep uh, a Mobutu-like, you know, entity uh, uh, controlling the territory, allowing foreign investment to come in, uh, again, because of the desperation of imperialism, and allowing them to do what they need to do. And so, uh, you know, uh, the culture of resistance, the culture of survival, you know, the culture of destabilization, the culture, uh, uh, you know, which uh, uh, takes away our children's ability to get an education and for them to develop and for them to make that kind of contribution that would really help to build, uh, you know, communities, villages, cities, towns. You know, all of that is taken away, and again, uh, to a certain extent, that is really the roadmap to, co- to colonialism all over again. That's why destabilization is so important. 
And, you know, and so therefore, it's important, like in Krumah's handbook, it pointed out uh, that, you know, we need the zonal analysis to look at how we're going to deal with imperialism. The most liberated zones need to be the zones that we can help to create stability, to help you not only create stability but become a place where people can go, where they can, you know, find stability, where they can kind of regather themselves and reorganize themselves. The contested zones are the zones that we need to go into, and, and, and maybe we have some, you know, uh, progressive forces there that we can align with, help strengthen those progressive forces so that they can become victorious to get rid of the reactionary forces and get rid of the imperialist forces. And the enemy-held zones are the straight-up, you know, Cote d'Ivoire, et cetera, et cetera, uh, where the enemy is totally entrenched. And who knows, there may be some progressive forces in, you know, Cote d'Ivoire, but in these zones we need a full-on onslaught to get rid of the enemy within those elements. So if Africa, you know, can unite itself with those liberated zones and those contested zones to support those regions that are destabilized, help support the progressive and grassroots movements so that they can galvanize their strength, unite, and strengthen themselves to go back into the battle. That's a part of the victory, as well as our own. These movements are movements outside of Africa. It's a part of the zonal analysis as well. We need to decide what side are we on. We have to pick a side. We can't sit idly by and don't think we have any relationship on. Hello? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's, it's important that, that, you know, we talk about these consequences because we need to put a face to this. You know, we say imperialism, neocolonialism, uh, colonialism, but we need to put a face to this by saying that, you know, people's lives are disrupted. You know, the marketplace is disrupted. And, you know, my children's school is disrupted. We be, begin to put a face to this and see how imperialist, uh, imperialism uses this sabotage and uses um, this, this destabilization to just turn people's lives upside down. Because we can just say these words, but... What does it really mean, and what does it look like? You know, and I, and I, I think, you know, this is a good segue um, to talk about um, sovereignty. You know, what is sovereignty? You know, and how does sovereignty apply to African people? Uh, I think, again, we can go to Okuma, who was very explicit when he said that when a people have uh, been smarted on the foreign rule, suddenly wake up to the indignities of such rules and begin to assert their nation and inherit right uh, to be um, free when they have reached a stage of their political development, when no account of oppressive laws and intimidation can keep them down. Inevitably, it is a prolonged and sometimes bitter struggle that, uh, that they uh, gain their freedom. Uh, he says history is replete with um, instances of struggle for freedom of oppressed people the world over. One of the things that, that Krumah is trying to remind us as African people, wherever we are, is that we have a right to be free, free from colonialism, free from tyranny, free from neocolonialism, free from imperialism. But we must make a conscious effort to liberate ourselves. It's the same fight, whether you're Mali or Detroit, Michigan, whether you're Atlanta, Georgia, or Guinea-Bissau, whether you're in Angola, Louisiana, or Angola, Africa. We're fighting the same enemy, many different fronts. But we have become, we have to become better organizers and better um, propagandists and better problem solvers. In the short time that we have left, how do we continue to get people involved in this movement, how do we get people engaged in struggle? Um, what lessons have you learned from our brothers and sisters on the continent that you can apply, or we can apply, to our situation here? Uh, I think that uh, uh, 
what we have to begin to do in in one of the you know one of the things that APRP is doing is that we are taking this discussion of Guinea Bissau uh, to the people, uh, whether we you know take it in a formal way. Uh, you know, in Atlanta, they had you know a gathering of folks, and they had you know some alliances and, and different organizations uh, attend, and, and, and some people, and have just have a discussion about what is going on in Guinea-Bissau and how is that similar to what's happening here. You know, the reality that they're discussing, uh, you know, uh, you know the the notion that. Uh, we are, you know, our economic situation is getting better. The fact that they are corporatizing every aspect of our lives, uh, even more so than it had been in the past. Uh, education, you know, uh, they're talking about, you know, uh, corporatizing it. Uh, you know, there are fewer jobs and, and more dependency on state uh, uh, entities where there is no more, you know, uh, welfare the way it used to be, no more food stamps, and, and there are more people that are homeless. Uh, in that same way that there is an assault upon the working class, an assault upon the non-working class, and a withering away of the working middle class, uh, they are doing the same thing with the assault on Africa uh, by taking away Africans' abilities to be able to control their own uh, territories so that they can uh, create an, uh, a thriving agricultural base, so they can industrialize, so that they can, uh, you know, build infrastructure, hospitals, schools, that sort of thing, so that they can, you know, build homes and create for themselves. Uh, you know, here where we are, we don't even own the land that we're on. We rent, and rents are going up and economic capabilities are going down. Jobs are being outsourced, and what patriotism, you know, uh, really has no meaning uh, because you're not patriotic to the people. You're only patriotic to the, the money. Uh, and so we need to have these discussions amongst the people to show the similarities in what we're going, what's going on. You know, it's interesting, no matter how reactionary Bill Maher is, I heard him say the other night is that, he, he says people aren't against socialism. They don't even know what it is. Uh, but when you talk about taking away their social security, they get all up in air, and social is in the word social security. So in, a, in, a, in reality, people are really for socialism. Uh, you know, what the, the enemy has done is try to create, uh, you know, a picture of what it looks like so that people will be against it. But really, people are for socialism. And so we need to really break down these terms and these realities and help create with the people the vision of the kind of world that they want to have. We need to politically educate our people, and the only way we can do that is in an organized form. If our people are more politically savvy as to what is happening, to understand historically what's going on, they'll pay more involvement and more attention to it. We, you know, we believe that the people armed with the, the knowledge of what's going on in their reality, they are, they're going to know what to do. And so a part of our, our big hurdle is, you know, can we have this discussion, not just on the radio, but can we get out into the communities and have these discussions in every neighborhood? We had a discussion in L.A. at the AFIPA Center uh, on March 8th on this Guinea-Bissau situation. We, we showed a film on Amil Car Cabral, and then we pulled our chairs together and just had a discussion of, you know, what, was, what were the people in Guinea-Bissau fighting for? You know, they were fighting for the same things that we need to fight for. Folks saying you need to have a garden, you know, you need to be able to create your own economic reality. Folks don't know how to do that, or they're afraid to do it, or the system is telling us we're not capable of doing it. And so all we're doing is looking for jobs. And so, you know, we need to really break down these various elements, but to do that, we're going to have to uh, step out of our comfort zone uh, and go to the people and have these discussions in every garage, you know, in every living room, 
uh, every place we can have them and have these discussions and then talk about how can we organize our reality differently. Can we create a collective garden, a neighborhood garden? Can we create a library where we can bring our children after they're educated by the enemy, then on the weekends we'll have the Saturday schools that our, our people used to organize in the 60s where we can give them the real education so they can question what they're being taught and learn about their own history and their own capability and their potential to, you know, envision a reality where they are in power and not, you know, the enemy taking away or, or having them beg for everything that they get. You know, we need to be able to create uh, opportunities for ourselves uh, so that we're not bound or dependent on the system. We can do that through organization, but to do that, we have to come together. We have to step up out of our little, you know, uh, uh, radios and, uh, and off of our computer and get out there and deal with the people and talk to the people. And this is the strength of PEIGC. You know, folks may not have much in Guinea-Bissau, but they believe in getting together, meeting, discussing, going to the countryside so that they can at least amass 67% of, you know, of an electoral vote amongst people who live in what we consider squalor conditions, but they consider it comfortable conditions because it's theirs. They're not renting their shack. They're not renting their hut. They're not renting their little place. That's where they live. That's, you know, they could create a garden wherever they are. And to take that away, they know what sovereignty is. They know, you know, what being free is. And to take that away, if you have a history of being willing to fight for it, to even die for it, it's going to be a lot easier to do. And, and that's what our people need to learn. What are they willing to fight for? They may not have to die. Maybe they will, but is it worth it? Would they rather be a slave or would they rather be free? Would they rather be able to control their own destiny and create opportunities for their children? Or would they rather be able to just be a pawn and a puppet and have to ship their children off to wars that have nothing to do with them, that won't advance their own reality? And in a sense, as we see, you know, uh, I think the statistics are, you know, 18 soldiers commit suicide per day in America over the, the, the mindless wars that they've been involved in since, you know, the Iraqi War and even the Vietnam War. I mean, is this the reality that our people want for their children and their grandchildren? I think not. But we have to be able to get our youth involved in the struggle and ourselves involved in the struggle. And, I, and many are involved in the struggle. But a lot of youth that I know that are organizing, they see a lot of, you know, head talkers and a lot of people who talk a lot of stuff or a lot of people who live in the past in these neighborhoods, and they don't respect them because we're talking about what we did in the 60s and 70s, and we ain't doing nothing today. And, you know, we need to set a better example. And so, you know, uh, there are youth that are trying to do stuff, even if they're just feeding the people. They're trying to do something and feed the people and talk to the people. But the pressure is going to get so that they're going to have to do a lot more. You know, but what we need is a way to reach those other youth that aren't doing anything. Because, again, the divide and conquer, that's going to be, you know, what's, what's uh, going to be the strategy if it's not already happening, you know, do you like dancing for the stars, uh, you know, or do you like survival? You know, do you like this or do you like that show? You know, they got people so twisted with this insanity that it's not showing them anything, teaching them anything. I mean, we have generations of mindless youth, you know, but we have to identify those that are picking up on something, that are listening to maybe some hip-hop that's conscious, you know, that are are interested in doing something or maybe they're touched in their own family with a reality that they don't understand, police abuse or whatever it is, and build on that. But we can start with the few and build from that because there wasn't a whole lot of people in the Black Panther Party, but they were enough serious militants that they shook the foundation of not just the colonial U.S., but the world and made an impact. And so we can have 
these kinds of movements within our own communities, but we have to begin to come together and get out of our, our little spot and get out with the people and have these discussions. You know, Sister Moya, I think it's so important what you're saying that, that you know, people start to have this discussion about what is going on in Africa and and to strengthen those ties because you know, as, as Dr. Clark say, we want to be everything but African. We want to be African American, African British, African Afro French, and we fail to realize that it is the Africanness in us that we all share a common history and a common struggle. I think we when you look at um, African people as a whole, whether they're on the continent or whether or not they're in the, the, the diaspora, you see that they're, they're led to believe all the lies, and all the myths, and all the false ac- accusations about Africa. But the reality is, is that it was a CIA operative operation that killed Lumumba, that overthrew Nkrumah in Ghana, and in a coup in, in Libya that you spoke earlier. But we can never forget that it was a movement that led to the independence of Ghana. Right. It was a movement that brought down apartheid in in Azania in South Africa. It was a right. movement that led to the independence of Guinea Bissau, Angola and Mozambique. Right. So what I'm saying is is that if we're talking to young people about our vision for the, for a new future, a vision for a new movement, then then we can draw on old slogans we need new ideas. We right. need new verses to that song. We right. need new words to communicate to our people in the language that they understand in order to create a sustainable movement that, as Nkrumah says, will deliver a crushing blow to colonialism and neocolonialism. It begins with ordinary people, the black youth, uh, that was shot down in Houston, Texas. You know, uh, right. the seven-year-old in Detroit, Michigan, Ayanna Jones, right. beautiful spirit. It starts with the the, the murder of uh, DeAndre uh, Bruston in Los Angeles. We don't have to go far to begin a movement. It just starts with a few people who want to make a difference and a, make, and a change in their lives and are willing to make some sacrifices. You know, That's it. we just have That's a few it. more minutes. Sister Moya Pembelli, uh, give us some parting words. What do you tell our youth who are coming into this movement for the first time, who are going through different stages of development and consciousness, who have a curiosity and a yearning for more knowledge. I know that uh, the, the Jewish people, they, after school ends, they pick their kids up and take them right to the synagogue, and they get Jewish history. And you mentioned something about liberation schools. What do we tell our youth who want to get involved in building this new movement for the liberation of African people around the world? I think, you know, the first thing that I would, you know, uh, tell the youth is that they uh, have uh, all the elements of the movement within within them, within the inside of themselves, that whatever ideas they can come up with, uh, that they should move on it, that they shouldn't wait for anybody, you know, or any direction or, or look towards, you know, some adult to tell them where to go or what to do. They already have ideas inside of them. Uh, and, uh, you know, and with that, because their history is based on, you know, th- you know, their history is really the history of our people. Because our, our history it has been an, uh, an objective of liberation, you know, a goal and a struggle for liberation, and that everything that they have been able to benefit from, all of the so-called civil rights and human rights our people had to organize for 
and some died for, and that they have the capability of translating that history into making history themselves or history, uh, you know, and, and creating the foundation for, uh, you know, democratic power, for uh, a culture of liberation and restoration and elevation and upliftment and empowerment that they have that with inside of themselves because oftentimes we get beat down by the mass media and these images that create the milieu that our youth are meaningless, that they're ignorant, that they're stupid, that they're violent, that they're drug addicted, that they're, you know, this, that, and the other, all of the negatives. So what we want to do is to say we need to transform our weaknesses into strengths that we already have strengths inside of us, and that is our history and our ability to even want to do something. That is a great strength and, and a victory for our people, that they have the, the capability with inside of themselves. The next thing they, knew, they need to do is to unite with other youth. Come together. See, nothing more important than unity. Uh, you know, the biggest enemy that we have are the enemies within ourselves that don't want to come together. Don't let ego, you know, or wanting to be the star uh, stop us from achieving what our goal is. We need to unite with like minds to form some type of organization or institution or structure or whatever they want to call it where they can come together and decide how they're going to carry out this struggle. Uh, to create the cultural foundation, because it is the culture that really brings us together and unites us. And so they want to create a culture of positiveness, of encouragement, of training, uh, of inclusiveness that brings in the, the youth, that brings in women, that, uh, you know, helps train and develop sisters and brothers, uh, you know, that seeks to reach out even to their elders. Um, you know, for assistance, education, training, you know, or just comradeship, that unity should be the crux, uh, you know, and, uh, and a part of the foundation that they build upon. Um, and then, you know, from there, they need to uh, begin to sit down and take seriously the importance of organization and execution of organization and reevaluating the plan laying out the plan, reevaluating, executing the plan, and, and continuing to go to higher and higher elements and not let anything stop them until they reach their objective. Uh, you know, and, and from there, we only learn by mistakes, but we don't make mistakes when we don't do anything. So we have to do something. And if we make mistakes, let's acknowledge our mistakes, approve upon them, and then go out and do some more work. We learn from doing. And so we just need to make it happen, you know, and, again, transform our weaknesses into strengths. Let our strengths be that which uplifts us and consolidates us and brings us together. You know, it creates uh, the milieu of development, of, you know, upliftment, of positive culture, of action. You know, it creates a dynamic uh, dialectical process that really helps develop our genius, you know, and, and from that, through this action, through this uh, integration of organization, unity, action, work, our, our genius develops and excels. That's what really helped launch a lot of the youth that were a part of so-called civil rights movement that was really more of a liberation movement because they didn't really study properly and realize what the ideological, political, and class differences were and where they wanted to go, some of those people who were very brilliant in terms of their work and really developed to be really, you know, critical thinkers and contributors to society, many of them took that and went and worked for the enemy that they were fighting against. A few, just, you know, realized this genius and began to work for it. And can, you know, and help to build liberation movements. And so we also have to be weary that as we work and we build, that we don't let our ideology co-opt us to end up working for the enemy instead of the people. So we always have to be vigilant. 
And with that, I say just, you know, look forward ever, backwards never, and always remain ready for the revolution. And Sister Lemoya, you know, such poignant and true thirst, you know, when we think about, you know, the youth, we, we don't realize that, you know, we came from a position of not being conscious to being conscious. And, and oftentimes we overlook that. But, you know, you reminded us that it's important not to overlook the youth and their contribution and their ideas because they bring a certain kind of perspective, a certain kind of energy, and a certain kind of awareness that is needed to sustain this movement. And a lot of times, you know, people won't even invite the youth to a program or they want to involve them in a, in a program. But we say that um, this program is about breaking down the barriers. It's about not this clique or that clique or that tribe. Or that. It's about unity. Right now, the principal contradiction in the black community is that we are fragmented and there is no unity. And so unless we understand that if I can't be free unless you're free, we all in the same fight. It does not matter because the goal and the mission is the same, and that's to get free. So, Samoya, yeah. we really appreciate, you know, your energy, your spirit, uh, sharing your, your, your knowledge and information uh, about what's going on in Africa. It, it creates not only this, 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 this bond and this tie, but it also gives us, a greater insight to what is going on on Mother Africa and for us to have the ability to once again, as Marcus Garvey say, to look forward as well as to look back. Because if African people don't have continuity between the past and the present, then how can we struggle to create a new future? That's right. That's it. That is it. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I want to say one of the greatest contributions that we can make in the 21st century is to create a multitude of mass media. And I have to thank the Harambe, you know, collective for contributing to that because we don't have our own mass media on the, on the you know, on the, 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 the TV, on cable, et cetera. But whatever forms we have, you know, that we've learned uh, from, you know, uh, from how many, you know, uh, centuries ago when we just had the drum, you know, or we just had the song, you know, or, or whatever we use uh, to communicate today by using the Internet, uh, you know, radio programs, whatever we have, one of the, the greatest contributions we can make is uh, providing mass media so that we can bring our collective together to sit down to share information to exchange information, and to hopefully create more unity as well as raising the consciousness of our people. So I want to say a Santa Santa Madase to the Harambe family. Keep up the work whatever way we can help. Uh, we know that you'll always be there for us. Uh, we want to create, and we want our youth to also contribute in this, because they, they don't realize that if they picked up, you know, the baton, uh, and be able to push certain issues that connected Africa to the diaspora, it would catch on like wildfire. And so, you know, we ask you to continue to do the work you're doing, train some youth uh, so that they can take on some of this discussion and so that some of their youth will call in and listen in because, again, their peer group is very powerful. Once mm -hmm. they decide, okay, yeah, we got a, a radio program as well, then some of the youth will listen in. You know, and maybe they'll start to listen to something and, and deal with something that matters. And so, you know, again, I'd like to thank you for inviting us. Thank you for keeping us close, you know, um, and may we continue to work and build and expand uh, and take Pan-Africanism to where it needs to be, and that is to the total liberation and unification of our people, Africans, uh, and Africa under a socialist united government. Um, and let we let us build, you know, a greater women's union, 
uh, women's movement, youth movement, uh, brothers coming together uh, and help us create a cultural revolution within a revolution so that we can move forward in the direction that our ancestors have led us in. Absolutely. And, and again, you know, we thank you for your time and energy. Um, you know, Harambe Radio, going into 10 years, is not only an institution, but it's a platform, um, a liberated zone, so to speak. So our people, if they have something to say to our people, you can always do it here at Harambe Radio, and in particular to and make it plain. I mean, we may not have... Um, uh, the Negro World or the Black Panther Party uh, newspaper, but this is the 21st century um, medium to which we can reach our people in real time and discuss things and the next day go out and begin to implement them. So we we do um, give uh, a lot of thanks to Brother Delani for, for having the determination and the vision to keep this thing going. And, uh, you know, we're going to keep doing what we do. And I'm, I'm going to put this out here. If you know any youth that want to come on to make it plain and tell what's going on in their lives, what they're doing in the community, you have a platform here at Arambi Radio Make It Plain. Absolutely. I certainly will share that. Absolutely. Well, you know, we've gone over time. I know Delani is ready to... Uh, you know, kick us out the building. We want to say, <laughs> <laughs> we want to say thank you again so much, sister. It's always, you know, an honor for you to come on and, and, and share things with us and, and converse and, you know, catch up on some things. We really appreciate it. Again, you have a uh, a standing invitation to come back um, anytime you want. Um, That's the first time. So. And, and certainly, and definitely, we're we're gonna we're coordinating a tour for Mama Charlotte O'Neill, and mm-hmm. she's gonna be here. So uh, on one, you know, well, we have either um, the April 10th or April 12th that we may have a little time in the evening. So if it's possible, it'd be nice to have Mama Charlotte on to talk about, you know, how does a panther leave here and and build in Tanzania for 40 years. And, and you know, and bring the struggle to another level. So I'm just throwing it out there that if you got a couple of sisters for something in April coming <laughs> up, you might be interested in. You know what? Shoot me an email and let's make it happen. Uh, sounds good to me. For whatever, back with never. Let's remain ready for the revolution, Harambe family. I want to say this is a brother Keem Jamal for Make It Plain Hotel. Black Power, race first.